Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Jennifer Merkel. I'm a trustee of the Interlaken Historical Society and will be tonight's moderator. I want to send a big thank you to our Historical Society Program Committee and the Interlaken Public Library for organizing this program about Farmerville coverlet weavers. Uh, a few housekeeping items before our program begins. Information about our events, programs, and membership can be found on our website, interlakenhistoricalsociety.org. We also post on Facebook and we will record this program and it will be available to view in a few days on our YouTube channel. This is a really exciting time for our society. We're in the process of planning a new community life museum on a lot donated by Bob Beltzler on South Main Street in the village. Our goal is to have an efficient and solid building where we can preserve and share our local history for generations to come. So I invite you to also check our website for links to fundraising pages and keep in touch for future opportunities to support the society. Uh, we're asking that participants stay muted during the presentation. And if questions come up for you during the presentation, please type them in the chat and I will make sure those questions are asked at the end so they'll be able to be answered. If you prefer to ask an audible question or make an audible comment, um, please use the reaction button to raise your hand and we will unmute you preferably at the end of the presentation um, so you can ask your question or make your comment. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Mary Jean Welsler and Marty Slavok have been collecting coverlets for about 10 years. Mary Jean purchased the first one at an Interlaken estate sale along with several quilts. And in addition to collecting, Marty enjoys researching coverlets and their weavers. Mary Jean is secretary of the Interlaken Historical Society Board of Trustees. And Marty is a member of the board of the National Museum of the American Coverlet in Bedford, Pennsylvania. He recently started an online coverlet study group, which is open to anyone interested in coverlets. They live in the town of Covert. Well, Mary Jean and Marty, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it. Um, a few uh, words of explanation, I guess, uh, at the beginning. Um, certainly, uh, thanks to all of you for. Uh, coming out on a very cold and snowy night for this program. Um, oh, that's right, you're all at home sitting by the wood stove. Um, well, thanks for joining us. We have really nice turnout. We really appreciate it. Um, Mary Jean and I are not weavers. Um, so we'll admit that right up front, um, but we are collectors. Uh, some people might say we're hoarders or pack rats, but we prefer the term collector. Um, and also researchers of local history. So we really enjoy digging into uh, local history and um, documenting what we can find. I'll also mention that most of the photos and the coverlets that are pictured in our presentation are our own, um, but we've noted um, where they are not our own and we got the pictures from somewhere else. I'll be doing most of the talking, but Mary Jean can chime in at any time. Um, the presentation will sort of be in two parts. Um, the beginning will be an introduction to coverlets um, so that we all have sort of a common understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about coverlets. And then we'll get into a bit of the history of two weavers who wove in Interlaken. Um, so with that, we'll proceed. So Jennifer already mentioned um, that we found our first coverlet in an estate sale in Interlaken, probably about 2008, we're not really sure. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, cover we're collectors. And so we were at this estate sale and I was ready to leave. Mary Jean was still digging through a pile of textiles and she came up with two wonderful whole cloth coverlets that we later determined were either very late 18th century or early 19th century. 
they were very cool. Um, and then we also found this coverlet. So we knew very little bit about coverlets at that point, but this is what got us started. So what is a coverlet? Well, very generally, it's a woven bed cover. So to distinguish it from say a quilt, a quilt is usually made up of fabric pieces that were stitched together, where a coverlet is actually woven. So I'm gonna make several generalizations along the way um, in explaining what a coverlet is. And there are always, always exceptions to some of these, gener to these generalizations. So hang in there with me. So a coverlet usually has a center field pattern. And by center field, what I'm referring to is this area in the middle here. I think you can see my pointer. And sometimes the pattern will repeat like this one does. And sometimes it will have one central motif throughout that center field. But then going with that, there's usually a border on three sides. So here you see a border on three sides of this coverlet. Again, there are exceptions. Some coverlets don't have borders. Some coverlets have four borders, but the most common is usually that there's a border on three sides. Another thing is that usually there are two corner blocks. You can see this one down here in the left and down here on the right. And here's close up of a couple of corner blocks. So the one on the left, you can see there's this center field pattern and there's a border that has a different pattern to it. And then when you get to the corner block, it has yet a different look to it. So that's what we refer to as the corner block. Some coverlets in the corner block, there might actually be text woven. The, might be some combination of a date, a place name, a weaver name, a recipient's name or the person for whom it was made. And sometimes there might be a, a phrase. So in this particular case, this coverlet was made for Catherine Ann Smith. She was the recipient, it was made for her. Impson is the name of the weaver. The date that it was woven is 1839, and it was woven in Cortland County, New York. Coverlets are often two panels that were stitched together. So this would be driven by the width of the loom that, that the weaver had. So they may not be able to weave wide enough to cover a whole bed. So they stitched, they would weave a longer stretch and then um, cut it and then stitch it together in the center so that the two panels would meet in the middle. And on this one here, you can see that the pattern doesn't quite match up the whole way. So you can see that it indeed is two panels. Here is a very unique example in this coverlet it was woven the two lengths that should be the two panels that get stitched together in the middle, but it was never separated. So this gives you an idea very clearly about um, how that would have happened and then how they should be stitched together to make a full width bed cover or coverlet. So what's wrong with this coverlet? Well, it turns out that somebody separated the two panels and when they put it back together, they put it together with the borders meeting in the middle and the center fields being on the outside. And you can see the corner blocks are not in the corner. So either that came apart and somebody stitched together essentially wrong or somebody took it apart and stitched it the other way. But that, that also emphasizes how the coverlets are many times two panels. So again, what is a coverlet? Well, 
sometimes coverlets have a fringe and it might be just on what we would think of as the bottom of the coverlet, the lower end, or it could be on the bottom and two sides. Um, and not very often would you find a, a fringe on all four sides. The fibers themselves were usually wool and cotton. The cotton is usually white or a natural color. The wool is usually the dyed yarns. So in these examples, you see several different colors um, and uh, it's not always the case, but the colored ones are often uh, wool that has been dyed. And sometimes, um, especially in the earlier coverlets, um, linen was used instead of or in addition to cotton and wool. So make again a generalization. There's sort of two broad categories of patterns, what we would call geometric, which is the one here in the left, and figured and fancy on the right. So the geometrics could be woven on a basic 400 loom that many, many uh, households had them. Um, <clears throat> And figured and fancy usually required a, a special loom attachment. And that would allow the, the weaver to make more complex images like you see in this example of a figured and fancy coverlet. So one type of loom attachment, well, I should say, I guess that the, um, it was usually a professional weaver, somebody who was earning their living by weaving, um, who would be able to have uh, acquired a loom attachment that would allow them to do the fancy weaving. So one, one type um, of loom attachment that supports this kind of weaving is was invented by Jacquard in France and it became available for use, I believe it was in the 1820s in the United States. So because of that, many times people refer to any coverlet as a jacquard coverlet, um, which is not necessarily always the case um, with a fancy coverlet. Um, the pattern on a jacquard coverlet was actually controlled by punch cards. So the punch cards would control the loom, which then determined the pattern. So this, in essence, was a, a predecessor to the computer, which was controlled by punch cards early on when the computer was first developed. There are other loom attachments that would support the making of figured coverlets. Um, one type was a, a barrel loom. And in this case, there was a, a cylinder with pegs that would control the pattern on the loom. Um, that was functioned sort of like a, a music box, uh, which has a cylinder and, and uh, pegs coming out of it, sort of the same idea. But enough about the technology, let's move on. So here are some other geometric patterns. Um, you can see there's a variety of shapes. Uh, <clears throat> but not much that really is um, an image of a figure of some sort or so that there's an assortment of geometrics to give you an idea of what we mean by geometric. There are though several different types of weave structures in addition to the pattern. So a geometric pattern um, in this case has a weave structure of overshot, sometimes also referred to as float work. Um, I don't know if maybe I can zoom in a little bit there. You can see a little bit how some of the warp threads go over multiple, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, weft threads go over multiple warp threads, um, which gives you the, the name of overshot or float work. 
And these could be done on a four shaft loom is my understanding. In this example also, here you see more of the coverlet. You see there's a center field pattern that repeats. There is a border and then there is a corner block that has a different um, pattern. So this is also a geometric pattern type, but the weave structure is double weave, also sometimes known as double cloth. It's essentially uh, two layers of plain, leave, plain weave um, where the colors are exactly opposite on, on the other side, which this folded over sort of gives you that, that picture. So there's two sets of warp threads and two sets of weft threads in order to do that. This is another type of weave structure for a geometric pattern. Um, I wasn't gonna bring this up really, but um, this is the weave structure is known as summer winter. It's a specific weave structure. And I bring it up because many people when looking at a coverlet that has essentially the reverse colors on one side and the other, where the one side is predominantly dark and the other side is predominantly light, they refer to that as summer winter. And that in many cases is incorrect because summer winter is actually a weave structure rather than that just that um, color combination. Here you see two very similar patterns, but the one on the left is the double weave weave structure and the one on the right is the um, summer winter weave structure. You should mention how to tell them apart too. Okay, that was Mary Jean, by the way. <laughs> how they, if, but the double weave, if you take the top and the bottom, the light side and the dark side and the spaces that are empty, you can pull them apart. Whereas in the summer, winter, they're, they're attached. They, they don't come apart at all. all right. so. Good, thank you. So here's another geometric patterned coverlet. It's also a double weave. Um, where you can actually see the reverse image here on the, these two. This is the front and the back, or two sides, I should say. There's arguments sometimes on which side is front and which is back. It's really a preference of what people like, predominantly white, the light color, or predominantly the dark color. But here you can see some imagery um, being introduced in what is otherwise a, a geometric coverlet. Um, so it's not just uh, geometric uh, patterns, um, but starts to look like a church or a cathedral in the border on this um, uh, coverlet. Now we move into figured and fancy. So this is a figured and fancy. So you see the amazing amount of detail and imagery that is possible when using a loom attachment um, that allows, that supports this, this uh, type of weaving. Um, this one happens to also be a double weave in the weave structure, but look at all of the, the cool little images that are part of this, um, this coverlet. Now this particular coverlet, the corner block does give us some information. This was apparently woven for Mary La Tourette, in the town of Tyrone, which is on the west side of Seneca Lake, north of north and west of Watkins Glen. Um, at the time that it was woven, that was the county of Steuben County, um, but it is now part of Schuyler County. This was woven in 1834, um, and the initials below HL we understand to be the initials of the weaver, and that was Henry La Tourette. Henry came from a family of, of weavers. There were weavers by the name of La Tourette in both New York and Indiana. Um, and uh, Henry wove in 
um, in the Hector area at one point, but then um, predominantly, I believe, over in the Tyrone um, area on the west side of Seneca Lake. So this is a figured and fancy uh, pattern, but it's a weave structure that people refer to today as tied biter wand. If you look at this, you can see these vertical lines, which is uh, part of how you can, um, uh, didn't help me much. Oh, okay, there we go. There you can see the, the vertical lines on both sides. So the darker side and the lighter side. Um, and this particular coverlet was woven in Lodi, New York by J.M. Davidson, who calls himself a fancy weaver. And he wove it for Elizabeth Reynolds in 1839. And this coverlet is also figured in fancy, um, known as True Biter One. Um, again, that's the name they give it for this, is given for this weave structure. In this case, it's got the vertical lines on the one side, on the other side, it's more of a plain weave look. Um, and this one was woven for, it's not exactly a corner block typical to what we've seen on the others, but this was woven for Lucinda France in 1856. And it is attributed to Henry Tyler, who was a very prolific weaver, mostly in Northern New York and in Jefferson County. And notice this one is red and white. So what is a coverlet? Let's just summarize here a little bit. It's a woven bed cover usually a center field pattern with a border on three sides. So corner block, usually in two corners. It's often two panels that are stitched together in the center. Sometimes there's a fringe. They're usually out of made woven with wool and cotton. There's both geometric patterns and figured and fancy patterns. There are several different weave structures. Two colors are most common, um, but um, especially in New York, it's usually two colors. Um, and in New York, it's primarily blue and white, though there are some red and white, they're just less common. And the peak period for weaving um, coverlets like we've been seeing is from the 1830s through the 1850s. There were certainly coverlets being woven before that, and there were coverlets being woven after that, but that was the peak period. Um, there weren't as nearly as many coverlets being woven after the Civil War um, with the increased in, in, industri, industrialization of, of um, weaving and looms. So here's a list of area towns with having known coverlet weavers. Um, that's quite a list right around us. So Farmerville, we're gonna talk about today, which is today known as Interlaken, Hectorville, um, Lodi, Ovid, Varick, Fayette. Uh, these are all in Seneca County. Um, Ithaca, Groton in uh, Tompkins County. We got Cortland in Cortland County, Scipio, over in Cayuga County. Further north, Pal Palmyra and Walcott over on the west side of Seneca Lake. We've got Benton and Penyan. And then further, a little further south, we mentioned Tyrone, but Redding, Tyrone, Orange and Monterey are all little small towns over there that have coverlets with their name on it. Going down further south, there is Coverlet Weaver in Southport, Binghamton and many others. So we had quite a few coverlets, coverlet weavers in our area um, and throughout New York. So Archibald Davidson was probably one of the most prolific coverlet weavers right in our immediate area here. 
Uh, he wove approximately from 1831 to 1849 in Ithaca. Um, he later wove in, in Warsaw, New York, in Wyoming County for a while. But uh, notice the corner blocks here on how they changed. So in 1833, one of the earlier coverlets, it just has his name listed as a weaver. And then we go to 1840, he's calling him his business the Ithaca Carpet Factory. So the weavers not always wove only coverlets, um, they wove carpets, they wove other kinds of textiles as well. So he, he uh, moved up in the world and called himself his business, the Ithaca Carpet Factory. Um, and there you can see one in red and white as well. So these are representative corner blocks from a couple of other area towns. Um, the upper left here, we see Ovid. So J.M. Davidson wove in Ovid, as well as lower left, you see J.M. Davidson wove, weaving in Lodi. And in the center in the bottom, we see not a weaver's name, but a uh, recipient's name and that has the location of Varick, New York. You can also see that the weavers don't always quite have their craft nailed down. This should be 1837 and the seven looks upside down and backwards to me. And then here is a coverlet with the local name of Hectorville. Uh, some of you may have seen um, the article that was published in the newsletter of the Backbone Ridge History Group, where Ron Walter and I are trying to figure out where Hectorville was. Um, there is no historical reference that we found so far to a place name of Hectorville um, in Hector or in the area. And then in the upper right, we see a coverlet, a corner block for the place name of Farmerville. Going a little further away, the upper left does not have a weaver's name. That is a recipient's name, Isaac Burgess. It's a little bit uncommon to have a male name on a coverlet, but it does happen. Um, most of the coverlets um, were woven for women or young women, um, but that isn't always the case. And in this case, uh, this was um, attributed to a couple of weavers that wove in Phelps, New York, Ontario County. And then the lower left here, the weaver was weaving in Scipio in Cayuga County. And on the right, we've already seen this one in Cortland County. And in the upper right, we see Groton, New York, um, which was where the family, the Conger family wove as that uh, extended family um, wove in that area or left that area to weave in other, excuse me, in other towns. Going across to the other side of the lake, I mentioned the other side of Seneca Lake, I mentioned um, the towns of Monterey, Tyrone, Redding, and Orange, now in the town in the county of Schuyler. Uh, at the time these were mo woven in the 1830s and 1840s, that was Steuben County. We're not sure how many different weavers there were in that area. I already mentioned um, Henry, Henry Lachrette, who was one of them. Going a little further afield, upper left, we see a coverlet from Orleans County. The lower left, we see a coverlet woven in, in um, Clinton, New York. Um, Bartlett French wove in Clinton and Waterville, both in Oneida County. The lower right, we see uh, a weaver working in Southport, which is near uh, Elmira in Shimon County. And then on the upper right, we see a Niagara County coverlet. 
So it was this coverlet that was exhibited at the National Museum of the American Coverlet in 2014 that got me started, I think, in researching local coverlets. Now this says S. La Charette, Farmerville, 1833 and Beatty. So we attribute the, the recipient here, S. La Charette, was who the coverlet was made for, it was made in Farmerville in 1833. And in the lower part, we're saying that Beatty was the weaver. So this doesn't say that it was New York, but being from the Interlaken area, I knew that Farmerville was a former name of Interlaken. And uh, so that got me researching um, what could I find out about a Beatty who was a weaver in Farmerville in the 1830s. One of the good ways to document weavers during the time period that they were weaving is to look in old newspapers for advertisements. So I found an advertisement fairly quickly um, in the Trumansburg Advertiser in 1835 for a weaver by the name of Lewis Abbott. And he was weaving in Farmerville in 1835. It mentions a variety of different kinds of things that he wove, including coverlets and carpeting. Um, it, uh, he also does dyeing, and uh, so it's pretty pretty extensive uh, operation that he apparently had going. I dug a bit further and I found an advertisement for a Beatty and Serine who were weaving in Farmerville in 1833, according to this advertisement in the Trumansburg Advertiser. So um, I'm not terribly sure why they were advertising in <clears throat> um, Trumansburg, um, other than it may well have been the nearest newspaper at the time uh, that had the widest coverage, and it was just seven miles um, essentially down the road uh, from Farmerville. So this mentions Beatty, which is the name that was on that coverlet, um, but it also mentions Serine. Um, Serine is a local name. Um, there is a Serine road in the area. Um, I checked with some family members and the feedback I got was there were no Sarines who were weavers. So I kept poking around. And the first sort of hint that I got who Beatty and Sarine were <clears throat> with, um, because I didn't have any first names, um, I was just going on the family names that were both listed in that advertisement. <clears throat> and I found this on, on Roots Web, where a William Beatty and a Mephibosheth, and that's the last time I'm going to pronounce that first name, uh, Serine, married sisters from the Wheeler family. And so I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. There is a connection between a Beatty and a Serine. And with a little further research, I determined that the Wheeler family did live in Ovid, <clears throat> excuse me, New York. Um, so I continued digging and a visit to the County Clerk's Office in Seneca County, I found that William Beatty purchased property on Main Street in Farmerville in 1833. So that matches up with the advertising date and the coverlet um, <clears throat> date that we had. Um, and it was only the next year then that I found another document that said that they sold property, but it was not just in William Beatty's name at that point. 
it was we, William Beatty and his wife, Sally Ann, and Basha, which is what they, how they pronounced his name as a nickname, Basha Sarine, um, and his wife, Maria, they sold that property in Farmerville in 1834. So that was a, a pretty short tenure that the two of them owned that property. Um, <clears throat> So I kept digging to try to find out more about both of them. Well, it turns out that by 1836, I found Basha Sarine listed in a New York City directory, business directory, as a carpet weaver. And he was listed in three different editions between 1836 and 1839. Um, in different locations, but still in New York City as a carpet weaver. So he was apparently already there in 1835 because I found other documentation that he, his daughter, he, his wife and his, his daughter was, the daughter was born in New York City in um, 1835. So he left the Farmerville or Interlaken area um, at least by 1835. So let me summarize what I found out about Mr. Sarine. So I've got his birth and death dates there at the top. He was born in Cold Spring, which is Dutchess County, New York. He was the third child of Isaac Sarine and Sarah Hannah Garrison Sarine. He accompanied his family to Hector in Seneca County, New York in 1821. So he would have been about 10 at that time. There's a family story that he was a friend as a youth with Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church or the Church of Latter-day Saints. The family returned to Dutchess County about 1830 when he would have been 19. The older brothers, John and Abraham, uh, were documented to have remained in Seneca County. And Vasha apparently also remained for a short time. So he married Maria Wheeler in Ovid in Seneca County. And in a letter, he states that he was in New York City by August of 1833. So it looks like he left even before the property in Farmerville that he apparently co-owned was sold in 1834. So I mentioned he was listed as a carpet weaver between 1836 and 1839. He was an active member of the Mormon church. He was a missionary to Michigan, Connecticut, Great Britain and other places. And he died in 1848 of consumption while on an Ohio river boat. So what do we know? Where did he learn to weave? So he was born in Dutchess County, New York, and there were coverlet weavers in Dutchess County during that time, but he was only 10 years old when his family moved to Seneca County. So would he have learned something about weaving before he came to Seneca County? We're not sure. And why wasn't his name on the coverlets? His name was in the advertisements. It said Beatty and Sarine. And the property was owned by both Beatty and Sarine, apparently, when it came time to sell it. So why didn't he get his name on the coverlets? We don't know. And then why did he leave Seneca County? 
he did continue to weave. So it wasn't like he stopped doing weaving. So he continued to weave when he went off to New York City. So that's a summary of what we know about Basha Sarai. Well, William Beatty was also something of an enigma for me. Um, he was born in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Did he learn about weaving from Bucks County weavers? Uh, we don't have evidence of that, but it's a possibility. In 1825, his daughter Eleanor was born in um, New York. According to the 1850 census, she was listed as having been born in New York. But we don't know where in New York. William Beatty was married in New York in 1827, and he had a daughter, Alicia, born in New York in 1830. But in the 1830 census, I have not yet been able to find him anywhere in New York or elsewhere. William Beatty is a somewhat common name. So um, it was a little hard to, to narrow it down, but I didn't find any William Beatties that uh, the dates and ages matched up in the 1830 census, which would have been the census that was closest to the time when he was in Farmerville weaving. So he's weaving from 32 to 34 in Farmerville. 1833, Beattie purchased property in Farmerville. 1834, Beattie and Sarine and their wives sold the property in Farmerville. 1835, they had a daughter, Sarah. Beattie and his wife had a daughter, Sarah, born in Michigan. So by 1835, they were apparently, had already moved from uh, Farmerville in New York to Michigan and by the 1840 census, um, he was documented as li living in Livingston County, Michigan. So in a, in a way we even know less about Beatty than we do about Sarine, but we do know that they apparently lived and wove in Seneca County, but only briefly. There are five known coverlets that have Farmerville woven into them in the corner block. In the upper left is the earliest one that, that we know of, um, 1832. Um, and it actually has the first initial W with Beatty. The photograph I've got here does not show Beatty, but it Beatty was on the lower part of the corner block on that coverlet. This next one in the middle at the top uh, was woven for E. Boardman. The Boardman family was in the Covert and Hector area. Um, and that was woven in 1832 and has the beady name on it. In the upper right, we have the one that caught my attention when it was on display at the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the National Museum of the American Coverlet, um, 1833 by Beattie. The lower left, we have a little bit different corner block. The upper parts just has initials, GWVD. And at the bottom, it doesn't have the name Beattie, but it says B and VD. More on that in a little bit later. And then in the right, we have a Farmerville coverlet from 1834. Again, at the bottom, it just says B, uh, but there was cross-stitched in the initials of SJS. Um, that was not woven in, but cross-stitched in at some later time. So apologize about the quality of these images, but these are what we've been able to come up with um, about the five known um, Farmerville coverlets. And if anybody knows of any more out there, I would love to hear about them. So this summarizes the five known coverlets. 
The 1832 one was formerly in the collection of the DeWitt Historical Society in Interlaken, now, or I'm sorry, in Ithaca, now known as the History Center in Tompkins County. Um, that's no longer in that collection. We're not sure where it is. Um, the other 1832 E. Boardman, the last we knew there was documentation that this was in descendants of uh, E. Boardman, um, but I've been unable to track it down, but I'm assuming it's still in, the, in a family member's collection at this point. <clears throat> and then the S. La Charette, from Farmerville in 1833 is in the collection of John Simmermaker, a collector in Indiana. And the GWVD Farmerville is in a personal collection, but I don't know where. And the last one there, the E. Scobie Farmerville is in the Winterthur Museum. Now a little bit about this coverlet that has in the corner block the GWVD Farmerville. And at the bottom, it says B and VD. This is a crib size coverlet. It's not a full size coverlet. You can probably sort of figure that out here in this illustration. It is probably woven by William Beatty, which is, and then, and also, Garrett William Van Dorn. And it was probably woven for Garrett William Van Dorn. So the top line, the GWVD initials for Garrett William Van Dorn. And the bottom, that's the usually the location of the recipient's name or who it was woven for. And in the bottom, the B and VD would be the last name initials for Beatty and for Van Dorn. So I'm suggesting that this was a joint uh, weaving effort on the part of both William v. Beatty and Garrett William Van Dorn. Um, and this was done in 1833. Um, we know of Garrett William Van Dorn because he was later known as a weaver in New Jersey. The Van Dorns were a family of weavers, coverlet weavers as well, um, and mostly in New Jersey, but there was one who had moved to uh, Michigan and wove there. Um, so we, Take a look at the one on the left, which is the Farmerville Beatty coverlet woven for La Charette. And then take a look at the one, the illustration on the right, which was woven by Garrett William Van Dorn, which you can see his initials at the bottom, but it was woven in millstone New Jersey. So the suspicion is that Garrett William Van Dorn acquired the equipment from William Beatty when he was in, in uh, Farmerville and they were working together. William Beatty took his family and moved off to Michigan and Garrett William Van Dorn went back to New Jersey with that equipment and wove actually very, very similar uh, patterns. Uh, so probably the same loom attachment um, that William Beatty was um, using. So the Van Dorn family continues to be a uh, common name in the Farmerville Interlaken area of New York now, um, but you know, that's, that's pretty much all we know about Beatty and Sarine, the weavers in Farmerville in the 1830s. So perhaps you have more information about either of these weavers or other weavers in, the, um, in our region. Um, and uh, I'd love to, to hear about any of that. 
So I'd just like to point out that the Interlake and Historical Society has um, two coverlets. Uh, the one on the left and the one on the right are two geometric overshot coverlets um, that have been in the collection for a while. Um, many of the area local and regional historical societies do at least have a few coverlets. I would encourage you to explore coverlet collections, um, visit and support those organizations that are um, documenting and preserving the history of coverlets and, and their weavers. Um, I've mentioned just a couple here that um, are known significant collections. Um, the Alling Coverlet Museum in Palmyra, the National Museum of the American Coverlet in Bedford, the Colonial Coverlet Guild of America doesn't really have a collection per se, but it's a long-term organization um, in that, that supports um, coverlet research and documentation. The McCarve Gallery in St. Vincent College has a significant collection and many of the local and regional historical societies have um, coverlets in their collections. As we mentioned earlier in the introduction, I believe it was, um, we've, I've started an online live um, coverlet study group. Uh, we meet once a month on the first Friday. Uh, we usually start it out by a brief presentation. Uh, it can be anything having to do with coverlets from weaving to dyeing to uh, coverlet recently acquired or some research findings that you just came up with. Um, so that, that usually kicks our discussion off and then it goes from there uh, once a month. If you're interested, feel free to contact me or you can visit the Interlaken Public Library website and there is a link there for enrolling in the coverlet study group, Interlaken Public Library. Um, hosts the Zoom session for this group um, and Interlaken Public Library is also hosting the Zoom session for tonight's program. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to uh, take a try at answering them. Thank you so much, Marty. So um, like I said earlier, if you would like to type a question or a comment in the chat, please feel free. Or um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a button for reactions. You can hit raise your hand and we will be able to unmute if you prefer to ask your questions live. Um, Douglas Tepper has a question, Marty. Who could afford a coverlet? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it certainly was something pretty special to have. Um, I've I've seen uh, prices. Um, it today it doesn't seem like much money, um, but it was pretty special. And um, I would say like middle, middle to upper class probably was able to afford uh, something as special as this to put on their bed. Um, most families would, I should say with respect to the fancy coverlets, uh, most families would have had several probably of the geometric coverlets. Uh, they could have been even weaving them in their, at their own home or somebody in the family or, or uh, could have been weaving them. So yeah, they're, um, um, there would have been coverlets in probably pretty much everybody's um, home, um, whether or not they would have had a fancy one and would have been able to um, actually um, get one woven with their name and date in it, that would be that would be a little bit more money. There was also many of the weavers um, would take um, they, they the the client could provide the uh, yarn, the wool that the weaver was going to use. I think for the most part, the weaver would have had his supply of cotton 
to be used, but the, the, the local family could be providing the wool. And in the advertisements, there were often specifications on how the wool needed to be prepared to make the coverlet. Um, sometimes the family would have dyed the wool themselves, but many, as in fact you saw in that one advertisement, the weaver might have had dyeing services to do that <clears throat> um, for their clients. Okay, uh, Chelsea, could you unmute Norma Press, please? Norma, you should be able to unmute and ask your question. Hi, Marty. Um, how would you clean a coverlet if it needs cleaning? <laughs> Well, I think the first my advice is don't clean it. Um, and uh, I am not probably the best one to answer that question. I don't know if Mary Jean wants to chime in, but in general, um, one needs to be very, very careful about how uh, to clean um, an item like this that is wool and cotton from well over a century ago. Yeah, I think if you have to clean it, you definitely have to take it apart because it would be so heavy if you had a full size coverlet. And you probably wash it like, like you would a really nice quilt, you know, lukewarm water, let it soak, don't pull on it, that kind of stuff. But I would try not to clean it at all. I mean, I know people yeah. do. Sometimes you'll see advertisements like of somebody selling a, a you know, coverlet on eBay or something. It's like, yeah, we just we just washed it for you. So it's all ready to go. So we like, just no put in the washing machine. No. Um, yeah, one thing is don't put it in the washing machine. Usually by hand. Thank you. Okay. There's a question in the chat from MJ Benda. How long would it take to weave a coverlet? And also was the red dye more expensive or harder to come by? Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that accurately. Um, I, it's my understanding that the, the red dye was um, less available or more expensive than the, the, the blue dye, which was uh, indigo. Um, and uh, so that's probably why we saw uh, more of that in New York, but it may also have been associated with tradition. Um, in um, Pennsylvania, you usually, you'd see um, multicolored coverlets that were woven, um, you know, not just two colors. There might've been three or four or more colors that were in woven into coverlets. Um, so, um, and what was the other part? How long? Yes. Um, um, I have seen, time on that, and I don't recall the answer. Um, I don't know if Mary Jean, if you do, or if any of the other listeners would know. Um, the, the time of weaving is really only a small portion of the time that it would take to make a coverlet. So setting up um, your loom to weave um, is probably a lot more time consuming than it is to actually weave the lengths that you would need for a coverlet. I see Ron Walter turned on his video. Ron, do you want to answer that question? Ron, could you unmute oh. Ron Walter? Okay. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, yeah, it was said that Sarah LaTourette, with the help of her brother, could do one in a day, but he did all the, the change in the the quill or bobbin in the in the shuttle and she just threw the shuttle but it 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 was hard to do one a day okay chelsea. Good. other questions yes could chelsea could you unmute jim crit crit again hi oh uh, i i'm I'm fascinated by the timeline. Coverlets are something that I'm 
fairly new to as far as doing a deeper dive into them. I know about them, but I don't have any deep history in them. But the timeline is interesting because I got to believe that going back to the 1600s, that some people did bring looms to the new world. And I think they may have been weaving things. And that may have been trade with the local uh, Indian tribes. As York, you've got the time frames from 1830 to the 50s. And that uh, is, uh, okay, my, I'm getting, my thing says I'm unstable. So are, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, Jim. Um, but I think we are, well, your question has to do with, um, certainly it wasn't just the 1830s to the 1850s when weaving was done for things like this. And yes, there were, there were um, blankets and coverlets and the like, bed, other bed coverings that were being woven for a long time. Um, hopefully you can hear me over my clock. Uh, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I like your chimes. Uh, no, I was just curious because I know more about from Seneca County uh, to Allegheny yeah. County and in between. And frame was when people were starting to move west in, in ended a lot of people came west from massachusetts right and west at that point was where you live that's right <laughs> and and also some people went a little farther and they got to like staban or allegheny county and allegheny county you were taking your life in your hands because that was uh seneca yeah Probably so the, the settlement there. the settlement of of you know our parts of new york and further west in new york really didn't happen until well after 1779, after the Sullivan campaign. Right. So the 1790s was when settled, some of the settlement really started happening, I believe. And so, um, yeah, certainly people were, were weaving um, and there are uh, documented geometric coverlets that date from that, that as early as 1771, not necessarily from, from uh, our part of New York, but uh, it's very uncommon, but there are a few of the ge geometric coverlets that have a date woven into them. And as far as I know, the earliest one I think is 1771, which is at the National Museum of the American Coverlet in Bedford, PA. Uh, we have one that I think is 1827 with the date actually woven in it. So there, there were, there were uh, definitely, especially the geometric coverlets woven um, much earlier than the time period. The time period I was talking about was sort of the primary or peak time for the, um, the, the figured and fancy coverlets um, up until basically the, uh, the, uh, the, the Civil War, really. There wasn't much going on after, but there were, by the 1776, there were some being produced as sort of um, centennial celebrations. Um, so, the, I mean, there were continued to be some weaving. Is there another question? Thanks, yeah. Jim. Uh, Beth Bevers asks, how should you store a coverlet in your home? Well, Beth, um, how should I answer that? I guess the it is accepted to fold them carefully, preferably not real tight folds so that that you don't have you know a sharp angle on the fabric when you're folding them um many people suggest that ideally they should be rolled on a tube so that there is no tight angles that's not something most of us are doing at home um i don't know if i should admit it or not but uh what we tend to do is we fold them small enough to fit into an old pillowcase. And then we can, we can uh, store them either on a shelf or in a cedar chest um, that way. Um, the National Museum of the American Coverlet puts them in, in preservation quality boxes. Um, and I think uh, some other places I've seen done slightly different. So I think mainly 
handling it carefully. Um, and, uh, and it is actually recommended that you periodically get them, unfold them and get them to uh, relax the, their fold marks. Um, rather, and tr probably don't try, try not to fold it on that, that center seam where it's got those stitches. And keep them out of direct sunlight too. Yes, that's very important. Yep. Linda's when, when we first acquire a coverlet, we put it in, inside of um, even a plastic bag and put it into our freezer just to make sure that we're not bringing any, any uh, insects along in with it um, before we add it to our personal collection. Okay, Linda Sini asked, were coverlets typically woven by men only? Um, no, um, though the figured and fancy were typically woven by um, people who were in it as a profession, and those were usually men. Um, but the the simpler ones, the geometrics, the overshots and other weave structures um, could have easily been woven at home and that typically the weaver would have been a, you know, females members of the household, but not exclusively, but most common. There are very few documented women professional weavers. Uh, Ron mentioned Sarah Lachret in Indiana, who is certainly one of the better known some people have asserted that Harry Tyler's daughter um, took over the weaving business when Harry Tyler died in New York. Um, that still, I think, needs a little bit more work to document that, but it makes a lot of sense based on what I've seen so far. But there are very few uh, female professional weavers during that time period. Okay, are there any more questions? You're, feel free to type in the chat or raise your hand. Yes, Molly, can we unmute Molly, please? Molly Poister. Am I, am I on? Yes, go ahead, Molly. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm wondering how many patterns there were and if certain patterns were more prevalent in different areas. Um, I don't know that anybody's tried to quantify how many different patterns there were. There's just probably about as many patterns as there were weavers and many weavers wove multiple different patterns, but, um, the, um, yeah, the, sometimes the, well, I should back up a little bit. The, <clears throat> the loom, there were several different loom attachments that had been patented um, and you could acquire this loom attachment and sometimes the loom attachment would come with some patterns. So you'd see some patterns that um, are very similar by different weavers, probably because they were using the same or very similar patterns that were provided by the, the patent holder. Um, but there, uh, people would also try to replicate something that somebody else did, uh, basically sort of re re reverse engineering a pattern that they saw somebody make. So there was lots and lots of different patterns, um, but you saw several probably on the slides that had um, the like cluster of lilies. Um, there's also several that have the, the four um, rows often referred to as the double rose pattern. Um, so you see some of those repeated a lot, or there are smaller motifs like eagles that get repeated a lot, or certain other types of birds. Um, you see on the geometrics, um, especially on some of the double weaves, where the border has sort of a evergreen tree look to it that's referred to as a tree pattern. So there's, there's probably a an endless number of patterns that people used. 
but you do see some similarities from region by region or um, you know if you can document that you know one coverlet weaver learned from another coverlet weaver he would have taken some of what he learned along with him when he went on thank you are there any other questions again you can type in the chat raise your hand Well, I'd be oh, very... I'm sorry. I, I just saw Len um, Geller raising his hand. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Unmute Len. Un unmute Lynn. Len. Just just a minute, Len. You're not. You're still muted. Hang on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, um, I, I, I wanted to ask you, do, do you have any um, knowledge of anyone currently uh, using a loom to weave in uh, upstate New York? Lots of people. Oh. Uh, but in terms of the, the geometrics, like we saw, um, there, are, there are many weavers around, not just in this area, but across the country. Um, doing weaving, doing dyeing and the like. Um, in terms of the fancy uh, coverlets like, like uh, we, we described here today, there are not very many. There's a couple of, of the um, uh, jacquard type um, looms set up like at the, uh, I believe it's the Science Center in Toronto, they have an active one. There's one in uh, Michigan at the, uh, I think it's the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, there's a weaver in Vermont um, who is um, got one set up and he's, he's doing weaving the fancy uh, coverlets. Um, so there are a few that are doing the fancy coverlets, um, but there aren't, there aren't many, but there are definitely plenty of people weaving um, different types of coverlets, the, the geometric patterns. No. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions? Well, if any of you have uh, coverlets in your family um, that have been passed down, especially if you're in uh, the New York area, uh, would love to uh, would love to hear about them and. Uh, and help us uh, figure out some of the history of the, the weavers in our area here. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Dan just gave a comment, great presentation, thank you. Um, yes, from all of us, Marty and Mary Jean, that was some fantastic information. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on Zoom. And one more thank you to Chelsea and the Interlaken Library for hosting this event so we could all get together safely. Thank you, everyone. Please have a great night.